Welcome to the Department of Endocrinology. I am Simon. In this session, I will be speaking to you about diabetic emergencies. I will spend a lot of time on diabetic ketoacidosis and mention in brief about hypoglycemia and non-ketotic hyperosmolar coma. Let's start with hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is the most common diabetic emergency encountered in the hospital setting. It can be a very frightening experience for the patient and his carers when it happens at home. What is it which precipitates hypoglycemia? Very often it's iatrogenic, either excess of insulin or excess of oral medication. It's very important to remember that the dose of oral hypoglycemic agents has to be reduced in the elderly and in patients with renal impairment especially with the older sulfonylurea preparations like Dionil which have an extended duration of action it's very important that we are aware of the duration of action and make appropriate changes in patients who are old and have renal impairment. The other causes of hypoglycemia are skipped or insufficient meals, unaccustomed physical exertion, alcohol injection and very very rarely it could be a result of drug overdosage by the patient. And what is it which is new in this area? And the things which are new are that people have developed safer oral hypoglycemic agents and uh, there are also drugs which have a shorter half-life and can be used in patients with renal impairment. There are new insulins and insulin analogs which don't have the problems which we had seen with the earlier long-acting preparations. How do we manage a patient with hypoglycemia? The first most important thing is to recognize the symptoms and all these symptoms are usually because of autonomic overactivity. They have tremors, they have sweating, palpitations or hunger. When the patient ignores the warning signs due to sympathetic overactivity, they go on to the next step where they become comatose, can have a seizure and may or may not recover unless there's appropriate treatment measures. In patients who have diabetes going on for a long time and also have peripheral neuropathy, as a result of autonomic dysfunction, they may not have all the warning signs and they may end up directly with neurohypoglycemic symptoms. And this sort of situation is called hypoglycemic unawareness. And this is a very important problem and has to be recognized by the treating physician and these patients should not be allowed to drive and this is also an indication for islet cell transplant in these patients. How do we handle this situation? If it is at home, the first thing which should be done is that these patients should be given calories either as glucose, sugar or whatever is available to put up their blood sugars. If they do not respond, the next step at home will be to give them injection glucagon. In the hospital setting, these patients should be given IV dextrose and this can be followed by a 5% or 10% dextrose infusion. Now I go on to my next talk on diabetic ketoacidosis and before I start on this topic, I would like to mention the two basic differences in patients with type 1 diabetes and patients with type 2 diabetes. I'll draw an imaginary graph on the screen and this is the graph of a patient with type 1 diabetes who does not have any insulin in his body. A patient with type 2 diabetes actually starts with producing a lot of insulin and over a period of time he produces less and less insulin and at the end of 8 to 10 years there is little insulin in his body which is unable to control his blood sugars and he at this stage requires insulin. So this is a patient who started off with large amounts of insulin but over a period of time the pancreas is unable to keep up with the match with the demand and he develops 
the features of insulin deficiency and becomes insulin requiring. So at this stage, a type 2 diabetic can also go on to develop diabetic ketoacidosis. So diabetic ketoacidosis is not a problem only of type 1 diabetics, it's also a problem of type 2 diabetics and especially if they have been on medical treatment for long. So what are the actions of insulin? Insulin has two actions. The first thing it does is it drives the glucose into the cell. The next important action of insulin is that it's an anabolic hormone or it's a hormone which helps in building up tissues. So when you have insulin deficiency, the problem is that tissues start breaking down. Muscle starts breaking down and releases amino acids. Fat breaks down and releases fatty acids. And the next slide tells us what happens further. So the amino acids from the muscle are transferred to the liver and they in turn are converted to glucose. And this is the process of gluconeogenesis. The free fatty acids from the fat cells is also taken into the liver and it's converted into glucose. So we have gluconeogenesis from both fat and from the amino acids and this in turn pushes up the already high blood sugars in this patient. And what is the end result of all this? When there's high blood sugars in the blood, it has to find its way outside and it passes through the kidney and as it passes through the kidney, it collects a lot of water along with it and as a result of water depletion, the patient becomes dehydrated and he can end up with renal failure. And if you observe, there's also a side chain. Some of the fatty acids actually become converted into ketones. And these ketones are excreted in the urine. And this is what we detect when we use a dipstick to diagnose diabetic ketoacidosis. And so what is this state? Diabetic ketoacidosis is a state of absolute or relative insulin deficiency. And what are the problems here? You have a problem with hyperglycemia and the hyperglycemia is already there to begin with. Then you have this process of gluconeogenesis and there's also one additional problem where you have a lot of counter-regulatory hormones coming in and contributing to the high blood sugars. The next problem is severe dehydration and acidosis leading to a deranged metabolic state. And what is it which causes diabetic ketoacidosis? Most often it is interruption of insulin therapy and this is a common problem in the adolescent age group. This is a naturally rebellious age where the patient may not accept his disease or he may seek attention or because of peer pressure may stop with insulin and this is the most common cause why these patients are brought to the hospital with diabetic ketoacidosis. The next common situation is sepsis and in the elderly patient it could be an underlying myocardial infarction, pregnancy in the relevant age group or any major stress like trauma or surgery. Very often diabetic ketoacidosis is the first presentation of a patient with type 1 diabetes. So what are the things which make us come to this diagnosis? There are three essential things. The first thing is presence of high blood sugars. It need not necessarily be in the 400, 500. Any sugar more than 250 is reasonable. They also have low bicarbonate, low pH in the blood and also evidence of ketones in the blood and urine. You will find that I, when I mentioned about ketones, I had actually mentioned three different ketones and in which you find that beta hydroxybutyric acid, astoacetic acid and acetone. Acetone is negative and these two acidic substances and when you have accumulation of these acidic substances in blood, you end up with severe acidosis. Beta hydroxy butyric acid does not come into the urine and so is not detected by the routine dipstick method. So summarizing the pathophysiology of this condition, you first have insulin deficiency, then you have a lot of counter-regulatory hormones coming in and contributing to the problem, then you have enhanced gluconeogenesis. And a consequence of this, you have high blood sugars, osmotic diuresis, dehydration, and renal shutdown.
and uh, and the breakdown of fat releases all these fatty acids and then they are converted into ketone bodies so how do these patients come to the hospital very often it could be insidious with increased thirst and increased urination sometimes present with vomiting sometimes with generalized malay and uh, a child is often brought with altered sensorium or there may be symptoms of intercurrent illnesses which have brought the patient to the hospital and what are the signs on examination you find that the child is severely dehydrated and you should remember that by the time the patient is brought to the hospital they are already lost about 4 to 6 liters of body fluid and uh, they also have signs of acidosis which is recognized by rapid shallow breathing they may complain of abdominal pain they may have altered sensorium and signs of the intercurrent illness and how do we proceed further the easiest thing is to do a dipstick and uh, as i mentioned to you it's only acetoacetic acid and acetone which you detect with a dipstick method beta hydroxybutyric acid should be detected in the blood and uh, glucose levels may not be high they may be as low as 250 as mentioned earlier and you find that for patients with high blood sugar levels there is also a paradoxical decrease in serum sodium so you have pseudo hyponatremia in a patient who has high blood sugars and somebody has calculated and said that for each 100 mg increase in glucose the serum sodium is lowered by approximately 1.6 mL per liter what are the things we have to do as an emergency in this patient the most important thing is to look at their serum potassium i'll come to this further down the line and uh, also do a total blood count the treating physician should be aware that ketosis by itself can cause uh, increase in white cell count and shift to the left which may not always indicate an infection so unless the patient is febrile or has other evidences of infection you don't have to start these patients on antibiotics just based on their blood count for people working in smaller centers where they don't have ready access to uh, automated serum osmolarity you can use this formula to calculate the serum osmolarity this is 2 sodium plus glucose divided by 18 plus blood urine nitrogen divided by 2.8 blood gas facilities are not always available and if you don't have facilities for blood gas measurement a venous bicarb is good enough and it may be all that is necessary for monitoring these patients during treatment phosphorus levels may be low and uh, these patients may also have falsely elevated hyperamylasemia what happens when we start treatment when we start treatment and give these patients insulin insulin drives the glucose into the cell along with the glucose it also drives potassium into the cell and that's the reason why we need to monitor potassium every one to two hours in these patients and what are the pitfalls the pitfalls are as i mentioned high glucose levels can contribute to dilutional hyponatremia high triglyceride levels also can cause a factitiously low glucose and uh, a high level of ketone bodies may lead to factitious elevation of creatinine the other tests which have to be done in these patients include a electrocardiogram chest x-ray cultures if they are appropriate and imaging if required and how do you proceed with these patients patients need very close monitoring in the first 24 to 48 hours and the ICU is the best place to handle these patients if it's not possible there should be somebody with them all the time and they can be also managed in the general ward the most important part of the treatment is to give them large amounts of IV fluids as I mentioned they have already come to you losing four to five liters of fluid and the first thing which has to be started is a good peripheral line with intravenous and hydrating these patients does two things it not only brings down the blood glucose it can also improve the acidosis in these patients
How fast should we run in the fluid? They say that in the first 30 minutes, at least one liter should have gone in, and then you gradually slow down, give one more liter over the next hour, and subsequently one liter over the next two to three hours. And <coughs> it's not always necessary for you to have a central line in these patients, but I would recommend a central line when you're handling an elderly patient with DKA. When the patient becomes eulemic, and when his skin tugger improves, he starts putting out urine, then you can start switching over to either half normal saline if there is hypernatremia and when the blood sugar comes down to less than 200 you replace saline with 5% dextrose. And how is insulin given? Insulin should be given intravenously. There's no role for subcutaneous insulin since subcutaneous insulin doesn't get absorbed in a patient who's dehydrated and in shock and there's also the problem of sudden absorption of all the subcutaneous insulin when his hydration improves. So there's no role for subcutaneous insulin, but there may be a role for frequent doses of intermittent IM insulin if there is no facility to administer insulin IV. The best way to administer insulin is as a continuous IV infusion if an infusion pump is available. If uh, infusion pump is not available, we can dilute the insulin in saline and give it slowly via a micro drip set monitoring the blood sugar levels. And how fast should the glucose come down? The glucose should decline at a rate of 100 milligrams per DL every hour. What is the problem if it declines very fast? If the blood sugar drops suddenly or uh, goes down to hypoglycemic levels, there is a immediate response of the body releasing counter-regulatory hormones and the patient can again become ketotic. So the problem here is to treat hyperglycemia and to prevent hypoglycemia. And as I had mentioned to you earlier, potassium enters the cell along with glucose and this is one situation where you start replacement of potassium while serum potassium levels are still in the normal range. If the patient does not have a previous history of renal failure, is putting out urine, and there are no ECG changes of hyperkalemia, potassium supplements can be started even when the potassium level is 4.5 to 5. There's no need to wait for the serum potassium levels to fall because this fall can be sudden and dangerous. And uh, Serum potassium levels have to be ideally monitored every hour, but in our setting, we probably monitor them every three hours until they are stable. There is no role for serum bicarbonate in these patients unless there is a life-threatening situation with sepsis, lactic acidosis, or the pH is less than 7.1. And when soda bicarbonate is indicated, we infuse 100 to 150 ml of 1.4% solution and correct the acidosis. But there is no role for bicarbonate therapy for patients with DKA in the normal situation. The next step is to look at what precipitated the problem. If it is an infection, we should take up cultures and start appropriate antibiotics which will cover all these infections and uh, await the culture report. And what are the complications and what is it which causes death in these patients? The leading cause of death in children is cerebral edema. And one way to prevent this is to be very careful with your fluid management and also monitor serum sodium and avoid hyponatremia. Hypokalemia is a fatal condition if it is not recognized. And so these patients have to be frequently monitored and the potassium deficit has to be corrected. And as soon as the patient is able to take them out, they should be encouraged to eat and uh, we should take them off the IV fluids as early as possible. And if they are not encouraged to eat and remain on parental feeds for long, there is always a risk of hypoglycemia precipitating starvation ketoacidosis because of low blood sugars. And 
elderly patients need close monitoring of their central venous pressure and that is the only situation where I would recommend a central venous line and we should look for features of pulmonary edema especially when we are rushing in large amounts of fluid in elderly individuals. What are the other complications? If not recognized, these patients could have deep vein thrombosis, myocardial infarction could be what has brought this patient to hospital or it can develop anyway during the intercurrent illness, acute gastric dilatation, gastritis, late hypoglycemia, respiratory distress and infection. These are the most common complications which we see in this situation. So having said all this, we find that if this patient comes to the hospital, about 98 or 99 percent of them recover and we may lose only one patient if they are treated early. And the signs of poor prognosis are hypothermia, oliguria and deep coma. The next step is to find out what is it which brought this patient to the hospital and if it is just uh, adolescent prank where they had stopped the medication, they should be educated about it. And if a patient is repeatedly coming in with DKA, they also need to have a psychiatric assessment because depression could be what is making this patient seek attention. And all these patients should be taught how to manage their blood sugars when they become sick. There is this natural tendency for these patients to stop all their medications once they have a small fever, but they should be told that the treatment is very different and when they are sick, they have to monitor their blood sugars and they may in fact have to step up on the insulin when they are ill. And all patients with type 1 diabetes should be given strips so that they can look for ketones in the urine and seek immediate attention when they find their ketone is positive. With this, I go on to my next topic which is non-ketotic hyperosmolar coma. The cl uh, clinical scenario is similar to what happens in a patient with DKA but these patients don't have diabetic ketoacidosis but they have evidence of high blood sugars and uh, come to the hospital very sick and I'll go on to my next slide and come back and explain this in detail. And uh, here as I had mentioned earlier it is a problem which occurs in patients who are elderly and have type 2 diabetes. And in my earlier graph, I had mentioned that patients with type 1 diabetes don't have insulin and are prone to DKA. And patients with type 2 diabetes have gradually declining levels of insulin and they still continue to produce small amounts of insulin, but which is grossly inadequate for maintaining their blood sugars at the end of 8 to 10 years. And this little bit of insulin which is still available in circulation prevents these patients from going into ketosis. And I'll explain that in a moment. So when these patients become sick, they have exactly the same problems as patients with type 1 diabetes. And here they also have proteolysis breakdown of protein from the muscle, um, release of amino acids and the amino acids going into the liver getting formed into glucose and this traveling down into the kidney collecting a lot of fluid and ending up with water depletion and renal failure. And the little bit of insulin prevents the breakdown of fat. So you don't have this part of this diagram happening in patients with non-ketotic hyperosmolar coma. The little bit of insulin prevents the breakdown of fat, there's no formation of ketone bodies, there's no ketonuria, and, but they have the other problems. They have hyperglycemia, severe dehydration, and they are very ill when they are brought to the hospital. So I'll go back to the previous slide and explain things. So this is the patient who still has some amount of insulin and this insulin inhibits lipolysis and ketogenesis. They present to you with very high blood sugars, high serum osmolarity and absence of ketones and this is a problem primarily in elderly type 2 diabetics and they come to the hospital very sick with severe dehydration. And what is it which brings on this problem? Most often it's an infection 
or it could be stress or an underlying cerebrovascular accident, non-compliance with treatment or dietary indiscretion. This is a situation which occurs in mentally compromised elderly patients who are living alone. So when the patient becomes sick, he is not able to fend for himself, he is not able to feed, he is not able to go and have adequate access for his water and uh, he also stops taking his medication and by the time they are discovered they have high blood sugars and are very sick and they are brought to the hospital. Unlike patients with diabetic ketoacidosis, this is a very high mortality situation where unless they are brought to this hospital and given appropriate treatment, they eventually die. The treatment is similar to what happens in patients with DKSA, but here we need to place a central venous line and monitor their fluid replacement, start them on insulin, parenteral insulin, and we find that the insulin they require is much lesser than in patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. Monitor electrolytes and correct electrolyte deficits as they appear, and the problems which happen and what are the things which lead to death in these patients are acute renal failure, coagulopathy, or a myocardial infarction. So that's my last slide, and thank you.